Welcome to Beyond the Goalpost. I'm Ashlyn Super. Each year, Georgia Public Broadcasting's Education Division hosts a live exploration where we take viewers on a rich and immersive learning experience without ever leaving the classroom. No permission slips required. From colorful reefs off the coast of Savannah to the mountains of North Georgia, we've explored some of the coolest places our state has to offer like the great halls of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, the largest towel manufacturer in the United States, and even a state-of-the-art water treatment facility. In this episode of Beyond the Goalpost, we're going to revisit sites from some of our favorite live explorations. And why not dive in with our very first live exploration to Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. No goggles are needed as we head under the sea. Take a look. Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary is a 22-square-mile piece of ocean located 40 miles south of Savannah, Georgia. It is the only natural reef off of the coast of Georgia that is protected by the government. Gray's Reef is a live bottom reef, not a coral reef. The reef sits about 60 to 70 feet underwater. The term live bottom is used because, as seen here, almost every square inch of the habitat is covered with living organisms. The hard or rocky seafloor typically supports high numbers of large invertebrates or animals without spines, such as sponges, corals, and sea squirts. These spineless creatures thrive in rocky areas, and many are able to attach themselves more firmly to the hard substrate. They would not be able to do this if the ocean floor was soft or muddy. Amazingly, these invertebrates we see here are animals, not plants. Because they secure themselves to the rocky floor, they do not hunt their prey. Instead, many invertebrates receive their food from filter feeding. Ocean water contains tiny bits of nutrients, including microscopic animals called plankton. Filter feeders suck in the water around them and eat all the nutrients, which help them grow. Other invertebrates, like this tube anemone, have very sticky arms to which plankton gets stuck. A relative of the jellyfish, this anemone uses its longer tentacles for defense and to capture prey, whereas the shorter tentacles we can see around its mouth in the middle are used for ingestion. Invertebrates are important members of the reef ecosystem and provide valuable resources for a variety of marine species. Here we see a diverse abundance of fishes, including black sea bass, Atlantic spadefish, and cubbyu. The large number of animals that call Gray's Reef home is directly linked to the assortment of live bottom organisms. The array of soft corals, algae, tunicates, and sponges serve as a food source, shelter, and protection for various marine life. Without the invertebrates, the community would not be as diverse. What makes Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary so incredible is that it's home to all kinds of underwater animals. The rich abundance of resources found at the reef makes it an ideal habitat for various types of fish. This reef ledge we can see here is about two to three feet tall and it's covered in growth. This growth, which includes sea sponges, tunicates, and algae, plays a very important role in providing essentials for sea life, such as food and hiding places from predators. Each animal found at Gray's Reef requires something different from the reef. The big angelfish seen here needs a special type of algae to eat, whereas this scamp grouper feeds on small fish, squid, and crustaceans. Other fish, like this group of cubbyu, use the area under the reef's ledges as a home. If you listen really carefully, you can actually hear them making drum noises as they move really fast. Like a dog's bark or bird song, this special sound serves as a way for the cubbyu to communicate with one another. In this case, maybe they're trying to warn each other that this giant scamp grouper is claiming this ledge as his own. Finders keepers doesn't always work in the ocean. While some fish like the cubbyu travel in groups, other fish tend to be more independent. The file fish, named for its flat body and rough sandpapery skin, likes to travel alone. This may be because file fish are known to be slow swimmers due to their small fins. 
but where they lack in fins, they make up in camouflage. With their ability to hide in small places and blend in with the reef, filefish can easily hide from those who want to eat them. But what happens if a fish is small and doesn't have communication or camouflage abilities? These tiny fish called tomtate swim by the thousands around Gray's Reef. Like many small fish, when tomtate feel threatened, they go into survival mode. They tighten their school to resemble a larger animal and swim away from approaching predators. Georgia is home to critters big and small, both in the water and on land. And there's no better place to see Georgia's wildlife all in action than the Okefenokee Swamp. The swamp is home to over 1,000 different plant and animal species and has been inhabited by Native Americans and European pioneers. I think it's time we explore our next location, North America's largest blackwater swamp, the Okefenokee. So we're here on the east side of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. I'm here with my friend Chip. And Chip, can you tell us a little bit more about why this side of the swamp is different from the west side, for example? This, this is the prairie side of the swamp. The peat on average is deeper in this part of the swamp and fires have, over the history of Okefenokee, burned out the peat bed in some parts of the swamp and created these open marshy landscapes that we call prairie. So Chip, what brought you out here into the swamp? How long have you been here and how do you know so much about this place? The, my, I'm probably sitting here right now because I have been fascinated with alligators ever since I was a little bitty kid. And since we've got a lot of alligators here, this became my place really early on. And the swamp has really been kind of at the heart of my lifelong interest in environmental sciences. With its varied habitats, the Okefenokee is known for its abundance of plants and animals. There are over 620 species of plants growing in the swamp. Animals include 39 different kinds of fish, 37 amphibians, 64 reptiles, 234 birds, and 50 mammal species. What's your uh, favorite part about being out in the swamps, apart from the alligators, of course? <laughs> I'd, I'd love the experience of the big wild, of being in a large landscape that is still fundamentally natural. And the Okefenokee is very much that kind of place. This is one of the wildest, this is one of the largest wilderness areas in the eastern United States. In 1937, President Franklin Roosevelt provided federal protection from logging and development by establishing the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge, which covers about 80% of the swamp. And within this refuge is a national wilderness area, which prohibits road construction and other man-made structures in order to preserve the ecosystem. So Chip, we're on this nice wide waterway here. Is this completely natural? This is not completely natural. This is an artifact. This was created by human beings in the late 19th century in a failed attempt to drain Okefenokee Swamp and convert it to farmland. Why did they fail? Technical problems, shortage of money, bad economic times. It was a combination of all of those. And it had it things, some things been a little different, we wouldn't have the Okefenokee that we have today. We would have a farming district. Do the alligators usually stay in these main waterways or will you find them further into the they're, prairie? They're, they're everywhere. They're all out through the Okefenokee wetland. Where do the alligators fit in, in terms of the other animals that they interact with? Alligators are predators. They eat other animals. And when they're grown, they eat almost any animal really that they can catch and eat. This doesn't mean alligators are off limits to other predators, however. Of the 35 to 50 eggs a female gator lays during a season, most will be eaten by predators. And about 80% of the alligators that do hatch will fall victim to other predators such as birds, bobcats, otters, turtles, and raccoons. That one's a little big for that raccoon to tackle. 
But with it being there, there may be some younger, you know, newer baby alligators in the area, and he'll sure eat them. So then how big does the alligator need to get until it's no longer prey and can now start uh, uh, preying on other animals? When an alligator hatches, it's only about that big. And so, and they, they grow here in Okefenokee about six to 10 inches a year. So it'll, it'll take them three years or so before they start getting long enough that most of these other animals will start shying away from them so a lot. So in the food web of Okefenokee, alligators are right at the top with the black bears. When they're grown, yes, they are. Okay. And do the bears ever interact with the alligators? Yes, bears love to eat alligator eggs. Ah. So in the early summer when the alligators scrape up these nest mounds, you know, out in the swamp, the bears can smell the, the ground where the alligators have disturbed it and they get out and they sniff and they find those nests and they tear them open and eat the egg. Of course, alligators and bears are completely different animals, mm -hmm. but I feel yeah. like one thing they have in common is when it gets cold outside, they tend to hibernate or shut right. down. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, uh, with, usually with cold-blooded organisms like alligators, uh, it's called torpor, but same kind of thing. It gets cold, they're cold-blooded, so their bodies are the same temperature as the surroundings, and so they have to be a certain level of warm in order to digest food into function. So when it gets cold, they just slow down, um, and that's how they overwinter. Generally, our alligators don't eat. Between, For how long, how long do they go without eating well, in the winter? Well, between about Thanksgiving and about Valentine's Day, our alligators aren't eating at all. They wow. live off of fat. What about the bears? Bears, our male bears, actually in Okefenokee, don't hibernate. But our female bears do because they have their baby bears while they're hibernating. But it's, it, to conserve energy, there's not a lot of food out here during the winter time. Uh, they eat heavily in the fall and then they basically go to sleep. Bears are warm-blooded, so they have to, have to eat a lot more than a cold-blooded alligator. Other warm-blooded animals, like birds, use a different tactic to find food during the wintertime. You know, birds, they're warm-blooded. They need a lot of energy. They need a lot of food. And so, because they have a high need for food, they have to move in order to keep themselves properly fed. It's food supplies more than any other single thing um, that causes most birds to have to migrate. There are a variety of bird species that call Okefenokee home, including hawks, vultures, woodpeckers, and herons. Oh, I see something moving over there. That's a bittern. It's a member of the heron family, like the great blue heron, but the bitterns are known for being very secretive and very well camouflaged. And they're really hard to see standing in that grass with those stripes and streaks on their body. It basically hides it from predators, but it also makes it easier for the bird to sneak up on its prey. It's a heron, so it eats fish and frogs primarily, uh, large insects uh, that it captures as it as it wades through the marsh grass. So, Chip, we've talked about animals that are predators. Are there any plants that are predators? Believe it or not, yes. We've got quite a few carnivorous plants in Okefenokee Swamp. This one is the hooded pitcher plant. See, it's got a little hood. It caps over on top. What does it eat? Insects, mostly. It lures insects into that leaf that is specialized to form a tube and there is a secretion that the plant makes that attracts the insects in. And then up at the top, there actually is a sweet uh, attractant, like so a the juice. insects will go to drink so the juice. So they climb up it, and they, when they get inside the top of it, they get down in the tube. You see how it's got these little white dots on the back of the leaf? Yeah. Well, that lets light in the back side of the leaf. You ever watched a fly beating itself against your screen window? Mm -hmm. And even if you go over across the room and open the door, 
He won't say, oh, there's the way out. He'll keep on trying to get out there where the screen is because that's where the light is. That's what happens with the bugs that get inside. The bug is misdirected and is trying to go out the backside until it exhausts itself. And there's usually a little water in the bottom of each of those and the bug winds up drowning. Other unique plants in the Okefenokee include the Golden Club, also known as the Neverwet. The reason we call this Neverwet is because of the way that the leaves, look at that, the way the leaves shed water. See, they don't really get wet. If you push it underwater, it looks like a force field on a science fiction movie, check that out. And the reason it does that is the cell structure on the surface of the leaf. Each cell, each of the cell walls is rounded which means with all those little rounded cell walls, there's a little sliver of air between each cell and the one next to it. And the surface tension of water doesn't allow it to get down into that air space. And so it just stands up on top of the cells and slides off. And it was that structure that the materials engineers copied to create Gore-Tex cloth a particularly good, you know, rain gear. We have so much to be grateful for when it comes to Mother Nature, from the clothes that we wear to the foods that we eat. For our final live exploration piece, let's take a look at how pollinators play a critical role in the reproduction of some of our favorite foods. Today we are in the beautiful mountains of North Georgia at the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center right outside of Blairsville. Well, this is a research station, so we do research projects of all kinds. We do apple research, blueberry research, even turf grass research, and of course we do pollinator work. A pollinator is something that moves pollen from the anthers, the male parts of a flower, to the female parts of a flower. Plants can't move. They can't leave to go find a new area to populate, so they are relying on pollen and seed production to continue the species. And in most flowering plants, to make a seed, a pollen grain needs to be put on the female part of the plant, and then it will grow a tube, and then we will have fertilization. And out of fertilization, we will get seeds, and that's where we get fruit. So it is imperative for a plant to be pollinated to continue their species. Pollinator examples, especially in Georgia, include bees and butterflies, but also flies, wasps, beetles, all those are insect pollinators. We do have some other pollinators like hummingbirds, but insects are the most efficient pollinators. Bees are efficient pollinators because their body is kind of built to move pollen. We have over 4,000 native bee species in North America. They have hair all over their bodies. Some of them have pollen gathering apparatus. They have eyesight that lets them find the flowers. And so when they land on a flower, they are easily attracted to the pollen. That pollen can be attracted to their hair as well. That makes them really good at moving pollen from one flower to another. Pollinators will find pollen by a couple different ways. They will find it through chemical means, which means they may smell something that is attractive to them, or the way a flower looks. So that flower is saying, come on, I'm gonna take you right to where the goody is, we're gonna get the pollen on you, and I'll give you nectar as a reward. Nectar is produced by flowers. It's a carbohydrate substance that bees and other pollinators need for their energy. The bees need pollen and nectar. Pollen is a protein source, and those bees are gonna eat that pollen, and they're gonna take it back to their nest to feed their young. So it is an important part of their life cycle as well. Butterflies are a great pollinator. They're not interested in pollen. They are only interested in the nectar. You know how they unwind that straw-like mouth part? That's only equipping them to get the nectar. And if they move pollen, it's just a happy accident. Pollinators are important in many ways. We want to have a really varied, healthy food diet. A lot of the foods that we love are fruits, like our apples and our blueberries, our citrus crop, our watermelon, our peppers, our tomatoes. All of those need a pollinator. We don't have a pollinator, somebody's gonna hand pollinate them. That means a lot of expense. That means you won't be able to afford a watermelon or we'll just eat a whole lot of corn and wheat. 
one way to help protect pollinators is not to be scared of them. They're really not interested in stinging you at all. So just be calm and observe them and learn to appreciate them. Students can plant a pollinator garden. If you live in an apartment and you have a balcony, think about a large pot. Put some pollinator plants in there. Keep them well watered and keep an eye on them. You're gonna attract some bees, probably some hoverflies, even if you're high up on the apartment balcony. If you live in a subdivision, just pick an area of your yard that gets a lot of sun and put a lot of beautiful flowering plants in there. All of those things are important in creating a pollinator garden. The world would not look pretty without pollinators. So we wanna take care of pollinators while we have the chance to do so. Here at the University of Georgia Bee Lab, we do research on honeybees primarily. We're also doing research on native bees as well. Our primary focus for several decades has been looking at how we can keep bees alive, educate students on the importance of pollinators and beneficial insects. We also educate beekeepers on how to keep bees alive, but also how to extract honey, how to feed colonies. Bees are probably our best pollinators. The life cycle of a bee begins with an egg. The queen will lay either a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg. A fertilized egg will turn into a worker bee or a queen bee. That egg will hatch into a larva. And the only purpose that larva has is to eat, and eat a lot. So it spends days doing nothing but eating and eating and eating. And depending on how much that larva is fed in its very early stage is within the first 12 to 24 hours, if that larva is fed royal jelly, it turns into a queen. It basically kind of turns the genes on to produce a queen, which is really cool. And then if it's an unfertilized egg, it turns into a drone. And a drone is the male bee, and the male bee's responsibility is to mate with the queen. That's it and then our worker bees, which are the females, which consist of about 80% of the population inside of the colony, they do all the work. And the minute they have emerged, they start going to work. They clean out the cells, they start taking care of the young, they start cleaning the queen and feeding her. And as they age, they go through these different chores. And their final chore is pollination, going out and foraging for pollen and nectar. Bees typically live in the summer months about six weeks. And the reason is because they basically work themselves to death because they've got to get out there and get the food and not only feed what's in that hive that day, but they have to be able to store enough honey to feed that hive all year long because in the winter months, nothing's blooming or very little is blooming. There's not nectar and pollen that they can be gathering. So they have to collect enough in order to get through the entire season. So these back here, we call these hives. They're made out of wood, and they're kind of like an insulation. Bees normally live in the wild. They're going to go into a hollow of a tree. And so that's what we're trying to replicate is that insulation, that wood. And it's easy for us to manipulate. These boxes can be removed, and inside of these boxes, we have frames. It's where they're rearing their young, and that's where they're storing their food. We normally will check on bees at least once a season. When we're doing research, we're gonna be checking on them a lot more often. Is there a queen? Is it a healthy colony? Are there any diseases? What are the mite loads? How much honey do they have? So there's a lot of things that we check seasonally. Usually when I'm going to go into a colony, I will always have a smoker, a hive tool, and a veil. We use the smoker to kind of trick the bees into thinking that there's a wildfire coming. So they think a fire is coming, they smell the smoke, so they start consuming nectar and honey. That way they don't have to leave home on an empty stomach just in case the fire reaches their tree cavity in a natural state. In our state, we're using artificial hives. The hive tool is used to pry open the colony. Bees produce wax, honey, and another substance called propolis. It's what they actually use to glue the hive together. And then the veil, maybe the most important piece of gear. The bees, they kind of key in on contrast, so your eyes and your mouth, they're gonna kind of key on that if they do get angry. The colors bees usually key in on are darker colors. A bee's natural predator is bears or even a honey badger, mammals with darker fur. So we wear a white suit. They're not as incentivized to sting us when we're wearing light colors. 
So inside of these hives, if you had a very large hive, you could have 60,000 individuals. In each box, maybe 10 to 15,000 worker bees and drones and a queen, obviously. When we're doing research at the University of Georgia Bee Lab, we normally want to have a number of different apiaries so we can move bees. That's one reason why they're such awesome pollinators, is we can pick up that hive close them up, strap them up, throw them in the back of the truck or the back of a car, and take them to a location that we want them. So for instance, in January and February, there's millions of colonies that are transported from the United States all over the U.S. to California for almond pollination. So that's the beauty of why honeybees are such good pollinators. There's tens of thousands of them inside of the hive, and so right now, all of those colonies that are in California are slowly moving up for apple pollination in Washington, across into the Dakotas for clover, into the Northeast for cranberries and blueberries. Then they'll come down here into Georgia for cucumbers and cantaloupe and watermelons, down to Florida for oranges. So you can move them around, and that's the beauty of honeybees. I think our bees rock. Bees do rock and so do all the other plants and animals that we've learned about today. If you want to find out more about GPB Education's live explorations, visit our website. You can also re-watch all of our previous programs and stay in the know about upcoming shows and locations. I'm Ashlyn Super. See you next time on Beyond the Goalpost.